back to the channel. This is Rob here at Smirking Gun Reviews. Back to talk more crime story. We're on season one, episode seven. It is called Pursuit of a Wanted Felon. But wow, is that just not really a great description for this episode. <laughs> this has this much to do with the wanted felon part and about this much to do with the complete collapse of Mike Torello's marriage to Julie. Uh, wow. Like, sometimes things take a real quick right turn on TV shows, but this had a little bit of build-up. We're only seven episodes in. They, this is usually something that they say for, like, finales, things like that. But no, seven episodes in, and Mike Torello's marriage, you know, Mike Torello, played by Dennis Farina, his marriage basically just, not even basically, it falls apart. So we know already that Mike's got a problem with his temper. We also know that his wife has been mortified by it and seeing it and, and, and embarrassed by it. We also see that his anger is really out of control. He never hits her. He doesn't yell at her. In fact, he treats her pretty well when he's there, but he's not really there. He's classic Michael Mann cop. If you've ever seen uh, Heat, you know, this is kind of like a foreshadowing for what Michael Mann does with cops' characters. Even in Miami Vice, it's the same thing, too. Um, cops trying to keep uh, a relationship going with women. Uh, almost to, like, the detriment where it makes you wonder in these cop shows, like, why do cops even get married? Now, that's TV. Now, I'm sure that there are a lot of, like, resemblances to the problems that real-life cops have with TV cops. Some of this is dramatized, you know, of course. But, like, it, when Al Pacino talks about how he's in his third marriage in heat, you know, because they just can't, they're too much into the job. These guys are very, to me, they're very selfish. <laughs> they're also kind of like children, in a way. They, they just, they don't weigh the consequences on these shows of, like, should they be in a relationship. It's like, they, they really shouldn't. None of these guys in these shows should really be in any kind of relationship. The ones that I actually appreciate are when they show cops that just go to hookers. To be honest with you, these cops are so deep inside their jobs that I'm like, yeah, good, go to a hooker. Don't ruin, don't ruin some woman's life. <laughs> Now, I don't mean that for real life people, right? I, you know, you do what you have to do. But like, cop shows, man, they have like the worst relationships, and his is no different. Cause even in this this whole thing, man, he just starts off on the bad foot. This is supposed to be the vacation that saves his marriage, but right from the get go, he gets to the place. They like the place, but the guy at the counter doesn't give him complete one hundred percent attention. And so he's like, what, do I look like a mannequin here? And it's just like, dude, you just had to wait a couple of seconds. Then they find out, okay, then we get the cliched, we don't have your reservation line. Now that's a little bit much, because he's like, I made the reservation myself. Maybe the, the guy tells him, it, maybe it's at another hotel. Maybe it is. Maybe he called another hotel and accidentally placed a reservation thinking he was talking about this place. It's possible. But, you know, it's a cliche. And it's, but it's pretty funny. But he starts it off, I mean, he basically assaults the guy at the desk just to get a room. And then when they get the room, it's this tiny little box. So he keeps talking about how it's like a prison cell. Like, I offered you, you know, I was going to give you a nice trip to the country. Here we are looking at uh, Lake County Lockup's backyard. So his attitude is, is terrible. And I love Dennis Farina, but Mike Torello's character is, he's a, he's a, he's a bastard. He, in a lot of ways. Um, in fact, I kind of feel like when you see Ray's relationship with his wife, you know, as a criminal, he's he's a bad, 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 bad person. But his relationship with his wife, I think, is a lot more stable than, you know, the good guy's relationship. Trying to, you know, keep up with the criminals is too much for these guys. Um yeah, she's mortified when she assaults this guy. It's like you can see it on her face. Um, and he's not making it any easier by pointing everything out either. He's just every single aspect about this vacation he complains about. Um, she's like, let's make the most of it. But he's acting like the world's against him here. Like every single thing. Now, the, the script is basically having all these things go wrong for him too. So it's pushing... It's pu the script is pushing this relationship to a frickin' end. Um, 
And, you know, he's in a lot of ways making things bad. Like, they la they're laughing here about stuff, but, like, the bed breaks. The shaking bed breaks. And, you know, I love Mike, but he's an asshole. And again, to quote Die Hard too, but he's my kind of asshole. Um, so he's, like, laying here in bed here, and it's shaking. The whole bed's shaking. They have two separate beds, right? If the bed is shaking that you're in, get in the bed with your wife. Who cares? You were going to have a king-size bed anyway. This way you're closer anyway. And if you wanted to get frisky, you're right there. But he wakes up, you know, like the next day. And then the next day he tries to get in the pool. The pool's too hot. The place even looks like a dump to me. To me, it looks like they're at the freaking local, you know, like local towny pool. But like a waiter doesn't give him his drink. You know, he doesn't take his drink order. They keep walking past him. Like, any service, customer service rep would say that that's bullcrap. These guys don't ignore you. They're trained to be right there. Even if they don't have time, they can say, hang on one second. Yes, sir, I will be right with you. These guys are just flat out ignoring him until he yanks a drink off the t cart. And he's like, what? What did I do? What did I do? And his wife gets up and leaves. And he's like, what? What's wrong? What did I do? And it's like, you know, it's obvious what you did. But he's just completely oblivious. Um, and uh, yeah, this for this show is definitely forcing them into a divorce. I don't know what it's doing. <laughs> then you know he gets a call. He goes to check up on what's going on with the precinct and everything, and his detectives. And they tell him that the feds have a lead on Holman. But you know he's like, well, nobody's gonna screw up my vacation. And I'm like, dude, you're doing it yourself. You're doing it yourself just fine. Um, but between, yeah, between the service and his attitude, and I was like, boom, I was writing this sentence down, right? But, <laughs> but between the service and his attitude, well, before I could finish my thought, the vacation is over. Like, it's over. And probably the marriage. They go to, they go to lunch, and it's breakfast, actually. And they, he says he had bacon and eggs, and they bring him oatmeal. And he's like, yeah, I ordered something I hate. And then he leaves it there. And then they get into this huge fight. And they basically, they're like, forget it. It's over. I'm going to Toledo where the feds have Holman. You know, they got him pinned down. So, but before he can get there, Krychek is trying to deal with the, I love saying Krychek. Uh, he's dealing with the feds. They, they're like announcing themselves to the world. Come on out, Holman. We got the whole place surrounded. You know, like it's 1930s G-Man, you know. Come out, see? You know, and so Holman's inside, played by Ted Levine, the great Ted Levine. So he's already telling his girlfriend, look, you go out there, you distract him. He goes down the dumbwaiter, right? He takes the dumbwaiter all the way down because they have the whole place surrounded. He sneaks out through the basement, gets on a bicycle, and bikes away. Because the feds were, the, the lead fed was more interested in getting his name in the paper, getting his picture in the paper, the, the headlines, being J. Edgar Hoover's boy, as Torello puts it, because he finally arrives and he's super fly TNT pissed, right? So it's, you know, even the other fed is like, man, why did you just, why couldn't you just wait? This was kind of their case. They know the guy. They know how to handle this thing. So Holman's in the wind again, which is great for me because I love Ted Levine and I like to see his character keep going, even if he is a piece of crap. So, uh, da, 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 da. Abrams and Suzanne, played by, so Abrams played by Stephen Lang, the defense attorney, uh, and Pam Greer's Suzanne Teller, uh, their things are getting hot and steamy, and man, did Pam Greer look good back then. I mean, she's always looked good, but man, she looked good in the 80s, boy. Um, so they're like, this is 1963, so a mixed race couple, you know, no matter what kind of like, she's, she's a, a journalist and he's a lawyer and, you know, it just, it's still frowned upon, which comes up later. Um, and then Mike comes home, okay? He's just come back because she doesn't, he, he, his wife doesn't know that he's back from Toledo now. So he stops off at the precinct, right, to talk to those guys about how everything went bad. And... He comes home unannounced to find the dude from last episode, right? Even I called it. I called it then. I was like, the guy who's clearly going to who's gonna get into a thing with her, he's sitting on his couch. 
He's sitting on his couch, caught red-handed. Now they're not with his pants down or anything, but he walks in and there's this guy and his wife comes out and he they he takes the TV, this old antique TV, and he's like, you know, you can sit on my couch, but you can't watch my TV. And he takes the TV and he leaves. And there's this great moment where she, in a huff, tries to go into the bedroom and slam the door, but the actress misses the door to swing it back closed, and they leave it in there as a flub because then she has to walk back and close it again. Now, I don't know if that was a flub or not, but it felt like a flub where she got upset, misses the door, and then still closes it, and I, they left it perfect if it was a flub because it's an honest kind of moment. She was that upset that she misses the door. And then he takes the, the TV and he throws it out the freaking car door. And I was thinking, man, I wonder how much an antique TV like that would be worth these days. I mean, not for like real any, you know, not to watch it on or anything, but like for, you know, actual value. Um, so Mike goes to Teddy. Teddy is this friend that he's, you've, we've seen in previous episodes where he's now in insurance. He's been trying to get Mike to leave the cops and become an insurance salesman with him, maybe making money hand over fist. You wouldn't have to worry about getting shot. But again, you know, he's there to to crash on on Teddy's couch and have an you know an, uh, an ear to to whine about stuff with, you know. But this guy's pushing the job still, talking about how it takes two to break a marriage, all that kind of thing. Um, and we also find out that. Teddy and Mike fought in Korea. So here's another kind of big old ding for why Mike is Mike. He went to war. A lot of these guys who came back from war are, I'm, I'm, I, I feel like the general population that went to war in Korea and World War II and all that, man, they came back like, like shit's hard when you come back from a war. And a lot of these guys had tempers and you know, it's, it, I'm not going to try to say too much more on that because I never went to war. I wasn't in the army. I didn't join up. So, but it just seems like a lot of these guys from that era that came back were like kind of, because I mean, if you see somebody's face get blown off, I mean, how's that not going to mess you up? Um, we find out, let's see, yeah, there's this guy with the hut story that he tells from Korea that they, they kept blowing up his house and he kept putting it back up and it's kind of like a the thing about his marriage where, you know, like, how many times can we keep trying before we just give up? Um, we get this scene between Abrams and Teller, you know, Suzanne and, uh, well, Stephen Lang and Pam Greer kissing. It is one of the most weird, awkward, fake kissing scenes I've ever seen. It's like people going like this. And then all of a sudden it switches from, like, barely touching with blah, 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 blah. To just like, mm. <laughs> it's just really weird. I don't know if these actors, they didn't look like they have chemistry. In fact, whenever you see them dancing, it just looks so bizarre. So I don't know if they had real chemistry or not, but they don't seem to have any. It's like the script just says, you guys are together. Because it's 60s and it would be kind of edgy. Um, Kaichek tries to tell Mike that Luca's sporting book is completely working now but he's just checked out and he then calls the secretary the secretary that we were introduced to a few episodes back that uh, her boss's wife was murdered he was the coin collector that died and, and she had the problem with her boyfriend and I said way back then way back then this is they're setting this up I can you can just tell and of course he calls her he's like if you need anything you know, anything. You call me and she's like, oh, I'm so glad you called. And it's like, oh, geez, like, you know where this is going. So he, you know, like, it's like a Betty Veronica thing, right? Was Veronica the blonde? Or was Betty the blonde? Well, whatever the, which one of the blonde was, he was trading her in for the opposite. Uh, so it's not even a day later he's calling her up because, like, you know, she cheated on me, so I'm going after another girl. And I kept thinking, so he's not happy ruining one life with his BS. He immediately, he can't be alone, so he's immediately rushing off into something where he can ruin this poor girl's life too. You know, how many years of hers is he going to waste? You know, because he's just, you know, I'm a man, right? And it's like, ugh. So, Goldman and Polly 
Goldman is and played by Andrew Dice Kelly. Polly is the stool pigeon that Ray Luca doesn't know about in his own organization. They're trying to figure out how to open up this safe that's supposed to have about two hundred grand from another crook. He's a guy who sets up scores, and they plan on ripping this guy off because who's he going to tell? The cops. Everything in his safe is like stolen. In the scene, Andrew Dice Clay, man, should have just stuck to acting. To be honest with you. Like, really, after the comedy started to go downhill, he really should have tried acting in more dramatic roles. Like, I know he was in uh, A Star is Born, but he's really good. I mean, there's a couple of times you feel like the old Dice Man's about to pop up where you're waiting for him to just go, Oh! Hey! But he's actually really good. Over these episodes, he's really, really good. Um... So they're, yeah, they're planning on ripping off this crook, but Ray, when Ray finds out, he's like, okay, well, just don't tell anybody about this score. You can tell Manny, the head, 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 head guy, but don't, t they don't say don't tell Bartoli, played by John Polito, but it's understood, like, don't tell Bartoli about this score, because Ray knows that he's got his own things going on. And so why should he bother giving him any more money that he's not sharing with other... when he's taking scores and not sharing the money around either? Um, and he tries to tell Bartoli, like, his own thing, like, which is another push that at least Bartoli understands, which is Luca wants to get into the junk business, which is drugs, heroin, that kind of thing. And Bartoli's like, no, all right, cops will be all over us. So you think things are bad now? You think being doing this job is hard enough as it is, being a crook. You start getting the drugs, the feds, and everybody will be up your ass, which is absolutely true in every kind of situation. It's greed, though. Greed and power hungry that these guys risk their lives and usually die for going into the drug business. It's like they're not satisfied with, it's like almost like chasing a high of like, well, this works, but now let's, let's get this and get this and get more and more and more, very Scarface you know, kind of situation. You know, the greed outweighs the idiocy of it all. And then they even have another scam going, where they want to rip off the Midwest Pension Fund. Okay? Uh, this guy, Hugo Stedman, though, he runs the board seat that, they're, that, that would be blocking them from, you know, they want somebody on the inside so that they can basically take the money from the pension fund of all these people, innocent, regular-ass folks like you and me, and they want to use it to just take their bank money out and then funnel it around so that nobody knows that it was even taken. So Luca tries to get this guy to bend to his will. And he's like, look, man, I built this pension. I, you know, I, I don't need any of this crap. You keep your money. You know, he's very Jimmy Hoffa type. And I was like, oh, well, this guy's going to die, like, right away. And boom. Like, Literally, like, they start playing this, like, uh, music that sounds like the Seinfeld music just kind of sped up. And he gets into his car. So no more Hugo Stedman. He in immediately gets killed. Like, no time at all. So now they have to figure out who to fill this seat now that he's dead. And Manny Weisbord, the head of their, their, their organization, says, Oh, he knows a guy who has a son who, you know, this guy, he helped build the, the union. And his son, we put him in here, he'll be grateful and we'll, we'll figure out how to break him into all this. Which comes off in spades later when you find out. Because he says, Manny says to put Ted Kehoe on the board. And I'm like, I didn't draw the connection right away. Meanwhile, Torello, here's him coming in, finding his wife, uh, cheating on him. Torello comes home, and well, Torello goes to meet his wife at a restaurant, and to kind of finalize things, like, where are we really at? And he's like, are you sorry that you did it, or are you sorry that you saw it, that I saw it? And she's like, I'm sorry you saw it. <clears throat> and, you know, he snaps. And she tells him, you know, he goes, look me in the eye and tell me you want that it's over. And she goes, when can you pick up your clothes? And it's the classic restaurant breakup. And believe me, I had a girl once who did try to do that to me. Uh, I remember she came back from this trip. And we were in this restaurant. I hadn't seen her. She came back. And uh, she's, we go to this restaurant and she starts to talk. And I, I look around and I could tell something was wrong. And I look around the restaurant and I go... Are you about to break up with me? Are you doing this here so I won't make a scene? 
I was like, oh, hell no. I was like, we're, I didn't even order, like, we hadn't even ordered drinks yet. And I'm like, we're out of here. You want to break up with me? We're doing it proper somewhere else. Don't you fucking put me here <laughs> where I can't make a scene. Like, screw you. Who told you to do this? Like, I bet you your parents, you know, like, whatever. <laughs> so, I've been there, done that, man. So, been there, stopped that anyway. And then we find out Mike goes back to Teddy's place. Where they're having a party where all the cops are there and everything. Because Teddy had, was, you know, a cop at one time. And we find out that Teddy is the guy they put on the board. His buddy from Korea is the one. Teddy Ke Ted Ke Kehoe. See, I didn't draw the line because they called him Ted, not Teddy. And I thought, well, you know, I just... There's a lot of Teds and Ted and Teddies and stuff. So his guy, his buddy, is now going to be on the seat that Ray Luca runs. This worlds are colliding here. It's going to be a craziness. So the gang's all here. Everyone's happy. Mike's looking at everybody with coupled up and everything. You know, even like he sees the mixed race couple of Abrams and Terry sitting there like, ugh. And he has to break it to the guys that he's getting divorced and cry check and everybody's just like, oh, he's like Debbie Downer all of a sudden so nobody knows what to say everybody just goes to like I'm going to go over here now meanwhile Suzanne played by Pam Greer has to take shit off of one of uh, Mike's you know brothers in arms Walter Clemens who's telling her this world's not ready for a mixed race couple and you know you've got a career ahead of you and, and you're going to take so much crap off of this is it really worth the, 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 the quick thrill and I was thought, man, buddy, like, I'm not going to call this reverse racism or anything, but, like, he's, like, just, you know, it, just because, like, I, you know what I'm trying to say with that. I'm not going to go down this road. But she's not appreciating what he's saying. She's like, I'm doing this for me, not for the race. You know, she likes this guy. And so their relationship, you know, of course, something's going to happen because of what he said. But by the end of this episode... Mike leaves the party and goes right for the secretary, who immediately is in his arms, and they are making out hardcore. So Mike's already moved on before the end of the episode is even ordered over. They don't even have the divorce papers signed yet before both of these two have made it into somebody else's arms. It's crazy, Tom Bananas. So that's the end of this episode. It's really fantastic. Only thing I don't like is that the transfer here on Amazon Prime makes this show look like it came out in the 1950s or 60s. It's a really bad transfer. Uh, hopefully the show someday gets a DVD Blu-ray upgrade somehow. I would pay for an HD remaster of this show. Michael Mann, get on that. Quentin Tarantino, I know you watched this show. I know it. Get on that. Get somebody to make an HD remaster of this show. Promote the hell out of it. This would be the mafia show, man. Like, forget the Sopranos. Like, bring this shit back. So, anyway, we'll be back next week with episode eight. Uh, not sure what it's called. Hopefully, the title has more to do with what's actually happening in it than this one. But, otherwise, uh, this uh, if you like this review, please hit the like button. Comment, share, subscribe if you're not a subscriber. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at reviews underscore gun. If you feel so inclined, you can donate to the channel and help make it better at paypal.me slash smirkingunreviews. Otherwise, we'll be back next week. Have a great day, and we will see you on the next crime story. Bye.